Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 339 of our Bible study review. Today we're going through the chapters 5 through 8 of 2 Corinthians. Now before we start reading in chapter 5, I just want to backtrack a little bit in chapter 4. As you know, this is a letter. He wasn't writing in chapters. He was writing one long letter. It's broken up in chapters for us as we read for convenience. But the idea flows from yesterday's reading into today's reading. So let's backtrack just a little bit. Chapter 4, verse 18, he says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now let's segue into chapter five. He says, we know that if our earthly house, this tent, he's talking about our bodies, were to be destroyed, we have an eternal building of Elohim in the heavens, a house not made with hands. He's talking about the spiritual body that we receive when our Messiah blows that trumpet, all right? We have a new spirit. Our minds are being renewed and we're going to receive a spiritual body that matches our spirit man. So that's what he's talking about. But he says, in this one, in this temporary tent, we groan, earnestly desiring to be sheltered with our house, which is from the heavens. He says, thus being sheltered, we shall not be found unsheltered. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we wish to be unclothed, but to be further clothed, so that what is mortal might be swallowed up by life, right? If you have a new spirit, then you long to have the new body that matches with that because we still dwell in these fleshly tents and these fleshly tents, they war against our spirit. They try to drive us back to the ground from which they came from. They try to kill us every single day, these bodies do. They try to remember us back to sin, but we are the ones who are actively, you know, crucifying the flesh day by day as we walk in spirit by faith. Verse five, let's continue. He says, now he who has created us for this very thing is Elohim, who has also given to us the guarantee of the spirit. So we have the spirit already. If you're born of the Holy Spirit, you have the guarantee of the spirit. Well, what's another guarantee of the spirit? If you're walking by the spirit and you're truly repented, then another guarantee is that body, that spiritual body that will not experience death ever again. Paul says, therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Adon. He's talking about Yeshua. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Instead, I say that we are confident and willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Adon. So whether present or absent, we labor for we must be accepted by him. We have to be accepted by him. So he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It's called the Bema seat. And I've spoken to you about that already. He says that each one may receive his recompense in the body according to what he has done, whether it was good or bad. Now we read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 12 through 15. There is a judgment for the work that you do. I know that you hear so many Christians say that, oh, you know, we don't we don't have to do any works. Yes, you do. You have to work. You have to live from the spirit while this fleshly body fights you to do what the spirit is calling you to do. There is a work and he is going to judge our work. So he says, right, when he comes, he's going to pay us for that work. Now, if your work was still of the flesh while you're proclaiming Christ, your Payment is going to be death and death eternal. Many will hear, depart from me. I don't know you, you workers of iniquity, you workers of lawlessness, aka Torahlessness. And the heart of Torah is love. It's how you love Elohim with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and how you love people as unto yourself. That's the Torah. Instructions for life. It's literally love. Love is at the base. And so since Paul was letting them know Again, that we will receive a payment for the work that we have done. He says, therefore, you know, our duty is the reconciliation, right? We know that our Messiah came so that we can be reconciled back unto the Father. So that's what he's about to speak. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Adon, who is Yeshua, he says, we persuade men. But we are revealed to Elohim, and I trust we are also revealed in your consciences. 
I'm going to skip to verse 13 because he's going to get to the meat and potatoes of what he's talking about, this reconciliation. He says, if we are beside ourselves, it is for Elohim. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ, the love of Messiah constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all have died. You're supposed to be dying to your flesh every single day. He says, and he died for all, that those who live should not live now on for themselves, but live for him who died for them and rose again. It is in him that we live. And he does not do Torahlessness. He does not do anything that is not righteous. He is righteousness. He is the word of the Father. And so now we live from him. So we cannot say that we have permission to be lawless. We have permission to then go back and live our lives in a life of sin. You will hear depart from me if you have that mindset and you practice that. Verse 17, he says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Look, all things have become new. All this is from Elohim, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, through Yeshua HaMashiach, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that Elohim was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. So that's our job, y'all. It's to help to reconcile the other image bearers back unto the Father. And you can only do that by way of of the Son. And you can only do that by way of the Spirit, right? The Son is the one who gives the Spirit. Now you must live from the Spirit, right? You must be counted worthy because if you appear before Him and you haven't lived from the Spirit, you still lived all of your life from the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom. That's fact, all right? We need to understand that. If we don't get anything else, we need to understand that. He says, so we are ambassadors for Christ. As though Elohim were pleading through us. I hope you understand what ambassadors are. We have U.S. embassies all across the earth, right? And different countries representing this country. And that's who we are in this world. The world system is ran by Satan. We are born of the kingdom of light, although we are walking in the midst of the kingdom of darkness, right? So we are to represent his kingdom, his righteousness, his Torah, right? with our lives, with everything that we do. Now, if we're not proper ambassadors, again, we are going to be in trouble when we come before him at the judgment seat. All right. He says, we implore you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to Elohim. Elohim made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of Elohim in him. He was perfect. He laid his life down as though he sinned, but he had no sin in his body. He gave his perfection to cover our imperfection. May we never take that for granted. All right, chapter six, Paul says, as workers together with Elohim, we ask you not to receive the grace of Elohim in vain. We just spoke about that, right? Do not receive the blood of the Messiah and then trample, trample that blood as if it's a permission slip to continue sinning. That is not what the gospel message is, okay? He says, for he says, in an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. And Paul says, look, now is the acceptable time. Look, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our service may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as servants to Elohim in much patience in afflictions, in necessities, in distress, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, and in hunger, by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by genuine love. Do you see that? They suffer many things, but they do it by the Spirit. They're able to endure because they live from the Spirit. That's what grace is. It's the power to be able to withstand when everyone else is coming against you. The whole world, the kingdom of darkness is coming against you, yet you stand. Yet you are able to withstand the blows and the afflictions of the world because you have the power of Elohim dwelling on the inside of you. Skipping down to verse 14, he says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness 
with unrighteousness. What communion or common union has light with darkness? What agreement has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he who believes with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of Elohim with idols? For you are the temple of the living Elohim. As Yahuwah has said, I will live in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now he said that in Jeremiah chapter 31, the new covenant, right? New Testament. And he says, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Yahuwah. Being separate means holy, set apart. You are no longer of the world, though you live in it. Okay, he says, do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says Yahuwah. El Shaddai. So the essence of this chapter is repent. Do not receive this message in vain. Do not think that you have permission to continue living lawless, being unclean. He says, don't touch the unclean things and I will receive you. This is conditional speech, y'all. So it's not, I confess Christ and then I'm good to go. I can live my life however I want. You will be sorry for thinking that way. You will be utterly surprised and shocked when you see the Messiah and he does not accept you. All right, chapter seven, he says, since we have these promises, beloved, the promise of the Father, the promise of the Spirit, the promise of the body, and the promise of receiving the kingdom, all right? He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. That's the work that we do, y'all. We've been given the Spirit, which is a grace. It's a power. Let us stand and let us take off the things of the flesh, showing ourselves, proving to be worthy of him. So keep that in mind as Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians and they weren't doing such a good job. He called them worldly. He said they were still children and they were not able to receive the meat of the word yet, that he could barely give them the milk because they weren't ready. And so he's about to talk about the joy of of their repentance, right? There's a report that they're doing a little bit better. And so he says, accept us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. And we have defrauded no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts so that we would die or live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting of you. I am filled with comfort and I am exceedingly joyful in all of our tribulation. For when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest and we were troubled on every side. On the outside were conflicts and on the inside were fears. But Paul says, nevertheless, Elohim who comforts the downcast comforted us through the coming of Titus and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he has comforted in you. When he told us about your sincere desire, your mourning, and your zeal towards me, so that I rejoiced even more. Though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. He says, for I perceive that this same letter has caused you sorrow, though only for a little while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorrowful in a godly way that you might not suffer loss in any way through us. Godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So I don't know if you remember yesterday in our reading, Paul said that he was going all throughout Macedonia and he was restless because he couldn't find Titus. Titus was with the Corinthians. So Titus was meant to meet up with Paul and give him the reports. Now, when he finally met up with him, he received a good report that because of the letter, right? The letter in 1 Corinthians, many of them repented. So he says, look, I don't regret writing the letter. He says, although I, I do regret it in flesh, he says, but not in spirit because it produced a godly thing on the inside of you. You repented from these things, and now you're working out your salvation with fear and trembling. So now I'm going to pick up in the middle of verse 13. He says, yes, and we were exceedingly the more joyful for the sake of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Titus went, 
right? And he knows that they had read the letter and they were sorrowful and he saw how they were changing because of it. They repented. And so he says, so I am not ashamed if I have boasted of anything to him regarding you. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even our boasting in the presence of Titus is found to be true. Now his affection abounds all the more towards you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore, I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. So you see, although Paul himself was not able to come and go the way that he wanted to, he sent other brothers who were well trained up in the way. And so Titus was one of them. And Titus came back with good reports. And he says, look, this has refreshed him. And he's telling them right now that this is refreshing my soul as well to know that you're growing up. And as we walk into chapter eight, we're going to see that he wants to encourage them to grow up a little bit more in one area of their life. He says, moreover, brothers, we want you to experience the grace of Elohim bestowed on the churches or the assemblies of Macedonia. Y'all know there's only one church. So he's saying the assemblies, the pieces of the body in different places, especially in Macedonia. He's going to tell you why, how in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty overflowed toward the riches of their generous giving. That's it. He wants them to be liberal in their giving. He wants the body of Messiah in Corinth to look at the Macedonians, the body of Messiah in Macedonia as the blueprint for giving abundantly. So let's pick up in verse three. He says, for I bear record that according to their means and beyond their means, they freely gave, begging us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of ministering to the saints. This they did, not as we expected. First, they gave themselves to the Adon, Yeshua, and then to us by the will of Elohim. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this gracious deed for you. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. Do you see that he calls giving a grace? Because grace is is a power. It's a favor to do something that maybe you normally could not do or would not do in your flesh. It causes you to be selfless. It causes you to love others as yourself. Do you see it? Paul continues and he says right here in verse 8, I say this not as a command, but to prove through the authenticity of others the sincerity also of your love. He says, look, giving is a part of showing and proving that you're actually genuine in your love towards the brethren. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. And in this matter I give my advice. It is appropriate for you, who began last year, not only to give, but also to willingly give. This is the context. It's giving and giving from your resources. All right. He says, now, therefore, complete the task so that as there was a willingness to do so, there may be also a performance of it according to your means. For if there is a willing mind first, the gift is accepted according to what a man possesses and not according to what he does not possess. I do not mean that other men have relief and you be burdened, but for equality, that your abundance now at this time may supply their need and their abundance may supply your need, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much had no access and he who gathered little had no lack. See, this is the model for the Acts church, the body of Messiah, when Pentecost, right? When the Holy Spirit fell, they gathered and they sold all of their belongings and they made sure that everyone had exactly what they need. No one had an abundance while somebody else had a lack. That's not how the body of Messiah is supposed to operate. No one is supposed to go without. When we come together, let us bring everything that we have, right? Remember that our Messiah charged the rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler said, I have done the Torah. I have done all these things. And Christ said, yet you have done one thing not. He says, sell all of your possessions and follow me. But he was not willing. Why? 
because his riches were a comfort unto him. And so Paul is challenging them now. Though in the beginning in 1 Corinthians, he says, I didn't want to burden you in the beginning. But he says, now that you're growing up, you need to understand that giving is a part of this thing right here. So he's essentially saying, look at what they're doing in Macedonia. What would cause someone to give to this measure? It is love. It's a change of heart. It's selflessness, not selfishness. All right. And so I'm going to go down to verse 23. And he says, if anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Or if the other brothers are inquired about, they are the messengers of the assemblies and the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the assemblies the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. And that proof is giving. Look, it costs money for him to send brothers to go check on them, to minister unto them, right? Ministry ain't free. It's not. It costs money to do these things. And so he's saying, look, prove yourself in this one thing by taking care of those who take care of your needs. Now, if you have it, you have it. But if you don't, you don't. But he's saying, if you have it, then why would you hold it back from someone who's pouring into you? Well, that's how this thing ends today, Deep in Word family. That's all that I have for you. Until tomorrow, Yah bless.